Good morning or good afternoon. Hello to everyone and a warm welcome from myself, Christine Desmet, and also on behalf of the co-chair of this first uh, virtual edition of the International Labeller Breast Cancer Symposium. The co-chairs are Steffi Oosterhuis, Otto Metzger and Patrick Dirksen. I also want to welcome you on behalf of the scientific and event, and event organizing committee. And finally, I want to welcome you also in this special patient advocate orientation session on behalf of the patient advocates from the Lubbeler Breast Cancer Alliance, from the European Lubbeler Breast Cancer Consortium, from Lubbeler Ireland and from Lubbeler Breast Cancer UK. So warm welcome to all of you. And now I give the word to Steffi Oosterheij. Thank you, Dr. Desmet. And I just want to you know, echo Christine's comment. Welcome, everyone. We are very excited to have this live here as the first virtual meeting, a new experience for all of us. And I just want to quickly say and remind everybody that we are recording the session. And, uh, you know, I think Shaban, Shaban will give you more, who's the moderator of this session, will give you more introduction on how we are going to run this and how the questions are being asked. So thanks everyone for calling in. We are super excited. And Shaban, I give it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon and good morning, everybody. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and just to say welcome to all of the attendees that are joining us here today and a special welcome to all of our presenters. Um, my job is, is very simple, uh, a brief introduction for our three uh, presenters today. And we'll do that in, in a moment, starting off with um, uh, Dr. Desmet. Um, and uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. So very, very simple. Each presentation will be about 20 minutes long and we're going to save the Q&A till the very end. So we'll have about 30 minutes, hopefully a little bit longer if we can for questions. So please remember to put your questions into the Q&A box. Um, and a reminder that unfortunately, as with many of these events, we just cannot take uh, personal, you know, questions about personal diagnosis. Um, but we're very happy to answer as many questions as possible. And you know, it's a good thing to perhaps um, ask your question in a very general way, um, and in which case it applies to so many of us. However, if it is a very personal question, um, then we, we would obviously advise that you take that back to your team and discuss it there. Um, the session is entirely patient focused, and we hope it will give all of the attendees a really good understanding of as some of the language around patient advocacy and therefore it will perhaps offer and we hope it will offer a, a better and fuller participation towards the scientific sessions over the next couple of days. So look, at that's it. I'm, I'm not going to um, delay any further. And our first speaker, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Christine Esmond. Unmute. Okay. Apologies there. We have Christine. Yes. Live. Good. Okay. Okay, so now you can hear me. Okay, so uh, during uh, the coming 20 minutes, I will try to explain you the ABCs of cancer biology and to tell you a bit more to understand about breast, about breast cancer, and about all the different things you might be hearing of in the coming two days during the uh, full symposium. So by starting, this is actually the outline of the presentation. So first I'd like to tell you a bit about the breast, about the tumor microenvironment, then I will explain you what mutations are. I will briefly touch upon tumor heterogeneity. I will explain a bit also about liquid biopsies and what experimental models are. So first, let's start with the breasts. 
Actually, the female breasts contain different types of tissues. First, you have the glandular tissue. The glandular tissue includes the lobes and the ducts. Actually, embedded in this tissue, you have every time like 15 to 20 lobes, actually each of which has smaller lobules that will produce the milk. The lobules are then arranged in clusters like bunches of grapes. The ducts that you also see there, actually you should see them as tiny tubes that will, when it's needed, carry the milk to the nipple. In addition to this glandular tissue, you also have fibrous tissue, which is sometimes also called supportive or connective tissue. And it's actually the same tissue that ligaments or scars are made of. In addition of that, what you see there in yellow is actually the fatty tissue. The fatty tissue you hear, it's actually fat. It fills in the spaces between the glandular and the fibrous tissue. And this fatty tissue actually determines most of the size of your breasts. Then at the back, you also see the muscle, the muscle, the pectoral muscle, which is actually important to give support to your breasts. So you might have heard also about the term dense breasts. Actually, so um, most of the, the, uh, the when you have um, dense breast, it's when most of the tissue that you see on the mammogram is actually fibrous or glandular tissue. And these uh, tissue types can look thicker and denser than fatty tissue, and they will show up white on the mammogram. And it's because cancer cells also appear white on the image that it might sometimes be more difficult actually to identify disease in women with dense breasts. And this will be also further explained in the last presentation of today. Then what you also see, the last thing I want to comment on on these slides are the lymph nodes. So you see there on the left, actually these bean shaped um, organs that you see uh, are actually found throughout of the body. But the ones that you see here are the ones that are often described also in the context of breast cancer. But what are lymph nodes? Lymph nodes actually, they produce um, and filter actually a kind of fluid which is called lymph. And this fluid contains white blood cells, white blood cells that are also called lymphocytes. So these cells are actually used to fight diseases in your body. And these lymph cells, they actually can carry the lymph from the breast to the lymph nodes. And the clusters of the lymph nodes near to the breast are located actually in the armpit or in the axilla. And these are also important because sometimes cancer cells can be found in so-called the axillary lymph nodes. So here you see a representation of how on the left a normal duct looks like. It's really a cross-sectioning. And then you see the evolution of how then it looks like when you have an invasive cancer. Actually, throughout of the evolution, you will have actually cells that will start proliferating, dividing without control anymore or with less control. And when these cells will actually go out of these ducts, this is when we speak about invasive cancer. So now let's take a moment to speak about the tumor microenvironment. So I've spoken about cancer cells, the tumor cells, but actually these are not alone. So because actually also in a normal breast, a normal breast is composed of many different types of cells. However, when there is a cancer, it's not only the cancer cells that actually change, it's also a multitude of other cells that normally are normal in the breast that also will change. And some will help the cancer to further grow, while other will kind of attack and um, make it more complicated for the cancer cells to further grow. This slide might be complicated, but it's for you to remain and to remember that actually the tumor microenvironment is a very complex 
environment where actually the balance between the communication that all these cells do together is actually constantly changing and quite complex. On the left, I've written three abbreviations of some cells that you might hear in the coming talks. So you might have heard a lot about TIL or TILs, and these are tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So these are the white blood cells that are present in the neighborhood or in the tumor. So these can have different characteristics, are supposed to help finding the cancer, but sometimes can have different characteristics. You also have the cancer-associated fibroblasts. These are cells that are important for the matrix, um, the microenvironment and, and the structure also of your, um, of your tumor. However, these also send different signals to other cells. Finally, the fat cells are called scientifically adipocytes. And we also have seen that these fat cells can also change in the neighborhood of tumor cells. We also often speak not about only the tumor microenvironment, but also about the tumor immune microenvironment. And there we now know clearly that some cells are really a bit the bad guy because they will kind of help actually the tumor to further progress, while other are actually really helping our immune system to fight these cancer cells. The balance between both is often complicated, can be also uh, defined by different factors. And this is also what we try to do also in science to understand how to reverse the balance so that actually we get more help from these uh, immune cells. What we also try to do is really to better characterize and understand how the tumor immune microenvironment behaves and is actually in lobular tumors. So now let's speak a bit about mutations. So don't be afraid, I'm not going to give you a very full genetic course, but I want you to give you some insights so that you might uh, be able to understand. So you know that your body is made of many, many, many cells. In the nucleus of the cell, you can find all the different chromosomes. And the chromosomes are made of DNA. And all this DNA actually has all the sequences of the different genes that will make who you are and the cells uh, who they are. So how should we understand mutations? So here I made a comparison. So on the left, you have the language of the DNA, and on the right, the English. So we know for English or other languages that you have normally 26 letters, so A, B, C, D, and so forth. For DNA, it's only four. It's A, C, G, D. In English, when you want to speak, you need to combine the different letters in a word. For DNA, it's just the same, except that these words are called codons, and that these codons are always made by three letters only. In English, if you want to further express yourself, you need to combine words in sentences. And this is the same. For DNA, you combine codons in genes. If you want to make your story more complicated, you want to combine many sentences in a chapter. And that's where you combine many genes in a chromosome. And finally, you can combine different chapters in a book and so you can combine all your chromosomes in your genome. So that's how it's structured. So always keep that in mind. So now things can go wrong when you get mutations. And mutations can actually happen at these different levels. For instance, imagine that you had a word, a codon, that was made by A, C, G. And suddenly the A is replaced by a T. That's just what we call a point mutation because it's just at one point. This sometimes can have an effect or not have any effect and not change any meaning of the word or the sentence or the chapter. However, some mutations can completely change the sense of a word or even of a gene or even change the full uh, meaning of a chapter, so of the chromosome, when sometimes big parts are just deleted, for example. 
So I hope that you understand this, um, this explanation. So this is another representation, for example, uh, to explain the different types of mutations that you can also have. So above, you can see actually a reference sequence of how it should normally be if everything was to be normal. So you see the sequence normally of your chromosome one. And you see at a certain point that what you expect to have normally is this letter A. However, you see that here you have a point mutation because the A has been replaced by a C. What you also can have a little bit further is actually that your, um, I will use the pointer, is that actually there might be a small deletion here. Or you can sometimes have a very large proportion of a chromosome that has been deleted, or you can have even proportions of chromosome that are gained or amplified. So now another nomenclature, if you want, for mutations that we use a lot when we speak about mutations with regards to cancer. It's about driver mutations and passenger mutations. So and it's very good, I think, if you keep this image of the bus in your mind uh, here. So the driver mutations are those that we say that confer selective advantages for cancer cells and that are causally involved in the development of this cancer. These are really the minority of the mutations. You have just a few for each cancer, actually. Then you have the passenger mutations. These are all the remainder, and they represent the majority of the mutations. They are actually just the scars of all the mutational processes that have uh, been going on during cancer development or simply also during aging. Because as we speak, we always accumulate mutations. So what do we know now about the driver landscape in breast cancer? These are the genes here that we know. The larger the size of the genes here, the most frequent they are actually abnormal, actually in, uh, in breast tumors. And since there have been a lot of studies that have been looking at in thousands of, of tumors, of breast tumors, and that have been looking very carefully at the sequences, we can say that this list is now almost complete. Maybe not completely, but almost complete. And what we know is that we knew already that most breast tumors were different, but we know now that we can nearly say that based on these combinations of the driver genes and based on many other aspects that nearly every breast cancer is unique. And this leads me to the concept of tumor heterogeneity. So we will really uh, tell you and you will see and hear again that there is a very strong interpatient heterogeneity with regard to breast cancer, meaning that uh, actually uh, every patient, the cancer of every patient is different. We knew already that there's a heterogeneity between cancer patients based on clinical characteristics, that each patient has a different combination of age of diagnosis, size of the tumor, and other characteristics. We also know that there can be different responses to the same treatments, even if, for example, the clinical characteristics were very similar. We also know that there are different subtypes, and the histological subtypes are one of those which is most relevant for you, because lobular tumors represent the second most common uh, pathological subtype of breast cancer. And then we have what I've just shown you, all these different combination of driver genes. Then what we also know is that within a patient, and here uh, I've represented a patient that has different metastases in, in different organs, we know actually also that within a primary tumor, and here I speak about the tumor that is located in the breast, that different zones of the tumor can have different information. But we also know that there can be a very strong heterogeneity between different metastases. 
And all of this needs to be very well investigated because it can possibly complicate treatment efficacy. So then a concept that you might have heard is actually the concept of liquid biopsies. So normally when you get a biopsy, we take a, a piece of tissue, a piece of tissue of the breast, or if unfortunately there are metastases, so if the cancer has recurred in other organs, there might be a biopsy from another uh, lesion, from, another, from one of these metastases. However, more and more scientists have looked into the possibility of investigating liquid biopsies, meaning taking some liquids of your body to investigate for the presence and the characteristics of your cancer in that liquid. And the most frequently investigated liquid in that context is blood, because it's much more easy to look and to take a blood sample than to take, a, a, for example, a biopsy in, let's say, the liver. However, while we know that we can really get in very important information there, we still need to make sure that the information we get there from the blood is really representative of the disease that is present in the rest of the, of the body. Then finally, I want to speak a little bit about experimental models. Experimental models are critical when we want to investigate some of the hypotheses that we might have had and that we want to test, for example, is it true that if there is this particular mutation, that that particular drug would work better? Because we cannot just test immediately in patients that would not be good, not be safe, and we need to have what we call preclinical evidence before going to the clinic. And to get that preclinical evidence, we need to test the hypothesis the new treatment strategies that we want to investigate in these experimental models. And we can have different kinds of experimental models and we will have beautiful presentations about that also um, uh, tomorrow or the day after. So we can have cell lines, for example. These are just the cancer cell that you culture in these uh, plates. And then you can also work, for example, with pieces of tumor that you will put into mice so that they can grow and that you can follow them. And you could treat then these mice with different treatment also to see whether the tumor becomes smaller and maybe disappear or whether the, tumor, uh, the treatment that you would investigate has no effect and then that the cancer further grows. And then finally, there is also what we call the PDOs, so the patient-derived organoids, which also have more information actually than just the cell lines, but do not use animals. And some also final important terms that you might have heard or that you will hear when we speak about research are the following three. So when we speak about in vitro research or in vitro experiments, it comes from the Latin for within the glass, which is a procedure in a controlled environment outside of a living organism. For example, in vitro uh, experiments that you do with the cell lines. In vivo comes from the Latin for within the living, are for example, the experiments you do with animals like the PDX or patient-derived xenografts that I showed you before. And then finally, in silico, refers to analysis, for example, that are performed on computer or via computer uh, simulation and really refers more to bioinformatics analysis of the data. So I will now conclude my presentation and I hope that I was able to give you a little bit of more insights of these terms that might sound of might have sound before like Chinese to you, and that now will be a bit more familiar to you. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I think uh, there's a huge amount there, and we are getting some. Um, really good questions in. I would just like to remind everybody to put your questions into the Q&A box 
and that we are going to keep all questions until all presenters have uh, gone through their presentation. So um, it gives me great pleasure now. By the way, somebody reminded me that I didn't actually say who I was at the beginning. So my name is Siobhan Freeney. I'm a patient advocate with the ELBCC. And in my nervousness, I suppose, I just forgot to say who I am. So I represent Lobular Ireland and it's a great pleasure to be here. Next, we have uh, somebody that I've become very familiar with. Karen works as communications um, I don't, well, she just looks after communications for the ELBCC and, and as such, she has a huge amount of interaction with us as patient advocates. So um, just very, very briefly tell you a little bit, Karen graduated as a um, MD in 2016. She's finalising her residency in gynaecology and obstetrics uh, under Christine uh, at the University of Leuven in Belgium. And in 2020, um, Karen began her PhD with Christine. Um, it's lobular specific, which is great news for everybody here. Um, Karen is a really valuable member of the ELBCC and um, I hand you over to Karen, who is going to give us a really good presentation. Thanks, Karen. Thanks a lot, Siobhan. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Karen, did we want to, do you think, should I go first to introduce a bit of a basic concept yes yeah, that's that's for me that's uh, great as well uh Shawan, i wonder whether uh, i do Karen and, yeah. you and i had talked and i think for logistical reason it might be good because some of the terms i might explain and then it will be easier to understand uh, yeah i apologize actually. i thought that was that was my mistake we had no, worries. no worries no worries no yeah, worries So, um, so I'm going to just welcome Steffi. I do apologize. Um, welcome to, to um, just somebody who looks after all of us. And we owe a huge debt of gratitude to you, Steffi, for your commitment to lobular breast cancer over the years. Um, you know, as somebody has affectionately um, once called you our lob mother. Um, you know, we, sometimes we're referred to as, as the lob mob, but that, that encompasses everybody, patients, clinicians, researchers. But yes, I would I would say, you know, um, we, we couldn't be where we are without the work and the commitment that you have put into this. And so, again, welcome to you and uh, apologies about the lineup there getting it wrong. Thanks. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, no concern. So um, thank you very much for the very kind introduction and thanks, Karen, for the switch. So like I said briefly, uh, Karen, this was the original order, but Karen, Christine and I had talked and we thought, you know, since my presentation really focuses on uh, the discussion and explanation of some of the basic biology principle, it might be better if I speak first and in that way, it will be easier to understand uh, some of the uh, some of the clinical trials and the clinical approaches uh, the next presentation will present. So I'm going to share my screen, and uh, hopefully this is going to work. And then uh, I will start. So, uh, yeah, so the title is Unique Aspects of ILC Biology, uh, Basic Introduction. And I thought about this and thought I would focus on three different pathways or genes. Uh, one is uh, loss of ecotherin, the estrogen receptor positivity of lobular tumors and growth factor receptor signaling. I think these three um, pathways genetic alteration you will hear throughout, not only now from the subsequent presentation from Dr. Van Balen, but also uh, throughout the meeting. So I think it would be nice to refresh or give you an introduction to this. So ecotherin or loss thereof is really the major hallmark of invasive lobular cancer. And some of the studies, especially the TCGA study a few years ago, really uh, showed that mutation, so genetic changes like Dr. Desmet just showed, uh, loss of the entire gene harboring ecotherin or protein downregulation occurs in the vast majority of lobular tumors. And just very briefly uh, here to show you, so ecotherin is basically a membranous protein. So this is the surface, a membrane of the cell. 
and it provides glue to the cells. It makes them stick to each other. And then in the cell, within the cell, it binds to different catenins, which basically regulate the cytoskeleton, the architecture of the cell. And it also allows the cells to make different movements. This, the loss of Ekaterin causes the unique growth properties of ILC cells. And here's an example. You can see this, that you have less cell cell attachment in contrast to ductal tumors where the cells really attach each other. Here you have much more uh, stroma and uh, other non-lobular cancer cells between the cancer cells. And as a result of this, they also grow in these typical sheets, what's often seen in lobular tumors. You can look for loss of ecoterin in various ways. This is a just basic staining, the histology I just showed. You can also do immunosal chemistry for ecoterin. So in ductal tumors, you see a staining, a brown staining, which surrounds the cells, and then lobular tumors. You don't get a signal. Or you can do something called a dual staining for ecoterin and one of the cutanians, which is called P120. When you do that, you have a brown staining for the ductal and the pink staining for the lobular tumors. And the way this comes about is that you basically give two antibodies, a brown antibody staining ecoterin and the pink uh, for P120. When the cell is ecoterin positive, you see a brown staining. You don't see a signal from the P120 pink staining because they are basically on top of each other. Uh, if you lose ecoterin, if the cell is negative, you don't get a brown staining. You only see the pink staining and uh, this P120 cutanean uh, moves to the cytoplasm of the cell. So it really spreads out and you get a, a pinkish staining uh, uh, all over the cell. So you can see this nicely here. So what about estrogen receptor? So, and again, I, I, I uh, uh, guarantee you, you hear more about loss of ecoterin throughout the meeting. So the second estrogen receptor positivity. So what is the estrogen receptor? The estrogen receptor is a receptor which is in the nucleus of the cell. It binds estrogens and then it binds to the DNA, gives various genes are transcribed. And as a result of this, the cells divide. It's something what we call a really strong proliferative signal. The vast majority of lobular tumors are ER positive, 90 to 95%. In ductal tumors, it's approximately 65, 65 to 70%. I do want to mention that, there, that these tumors, the lobular tumors, are really known to be exquisitely uh, hormone responsive. And one example I want to mention here from a paper from uh, Chris Lee, uh, Dr. Chris Lee a few years ago, is that the risk associated with uh, hormone use uh, is higher for ILC than IDC. If anybody's more interested, you can look in his paper, but basically whether the hormone replacement therapy is estrogen only or estrogen with progesterone, the risk is really much higher for to develop lobular than ductal tumors, which we think might be uh, a result of this very increased hormone responsiveness of uh, uh, cells which can develop into lobular cancer. How they are targeted, I will just briefly mention because again, the subsequent talk will talk uh, will present more on this. But again, estrodi the receptor is in the cell. You can block binding to estrogen this tamoxifen, which we also call a selective estrogen receptor modulator. You can degrade the receptor, this uh, ICI182780, also called full vestrand, which we call a selective estrogen receptor down regulator. Or in postmenopausal women, you can block synthesis of estradiol by uh, using aromatase inhibitors. We can measure estrogen receptor in uh, models we use in the lab in cell lines. And here are two examples for ductal cancer cell lines or lobular cancer cell lines. We can run something we call an immunoblot. Uh, we run proteins on a gel. It separates the proteins by size. You transfer them in the membrane, and then you can look for expression of your protein of interest. And here we look for estrogen receptor. You can see it's highly expressed in lobular cancer cell lines. These cells do not express ecoterin, and we just do a control to see that blood actually worked. Uh, 
We can also stain uh, cell lines. Uh, again, two lobular cancer cell lines, and when we stain for estrogen receptor, we can see a really nice dark brown signal. And this is this dual EKTRN P120 I talked about earlier. We can also test for estrogen response and anti-estrogen response in cells in culture. So this is a uh, uh, study, like Christine mentioned earlier, like what we would call an in vitro experiment. We take cells, we put them in a dish, and then we give the cells increasing concentration of estrogen. And you can see, we can, we can count the cells and we can basically look at growth or proliferation. The more estradiol you give, the more the cells grow. And we, we can then block growth by giving tamoxifen or fulvestrin. This is increasing concentration. For the blue line here, fulvestrin, the red line, tamoxifen. And you can see you get less growth, we count fewer cells. And uh, the reason I'm showing this here is not only to uh, show you that you can do this in the lab, but also to show you that there is a difference here in fulvestrin and tamoxifen. That tamoxifen, basically, the growth doesn't go back to baseline. We cannot totally kill these cells. And this is a, a lobular cancer cell line. I also want to show that in this cell line, this is a model for actually where tamoxifen almost uh, functions as an agonist. So in the absence of estradiol, this very low dose of estrogen, tamoxifen actually makes these cells a little bit, a little bit grow. So this is a, a really good model where tamoxifen uh, functions uh, a little bit as a growth stimulator. So, so much about estrogen receptor, and I want to end this growth factor receptor signaling again. I think you will hear throughout the duration of the symposium on growth factor receptor signaling. Growth factor receptors are proteins which also sit in the membrane. They become they can bind various ligands uh, from the environment uh, around the tumor, and then they become modified. This P stands for phosphorylated, and they can turn on a cascade of downstream signaling events. Uh, I read those out here, PI3 kinase, AKT, mTOR. And here are a couple of publications which have shown activation of these growth factor receptor pathways, specifically in lobular tumors. Uh, Christine, Dr. Desmet, had actually shown a few years ago that uh, her two and her three some examples of these growth factor receptors uh, become mutated in some cases of lobular tumors. And this was also shown in another study from uh, Foundation Medicine, where the authors showed that Ekaterin mutation could occur very often with HER2, ERB2 mutation. These mutations in these growth factor receptors, HER2, HER3, are specifically enriched in pleomorphic ILC. And this obviously is of uh, potential clinical relevance, given that there are a number of drugs targeting the HER pathway. And again, I think we'll, more hope, we'll hear more about this from Karen in a minute. There are not only uh, EGFR, HER2, HER3 growth factor receptor, there are other growth factor receptors like IGF receptor, FGF receptor, and there is also evidence from our lab and uh, Dr. Patrick Dirksen's lab that a lot of these pathways are activated in lobular tumors and actually say hyperactivated when we compare ductal to lobular cancers from very large databases. This is an example from the TCGA database. We can see more of the ligand in lobular tumors, and we can see more activation of these co spectral receptors. And this is uh, IGF-1 receptor in this example. These cells, when you, the lobular cells without ekaterin versus cells with ekaterin, they also become more sensitive to IGF receptor inhibitors. Uh, again, a couple of uh, this has been published in a couple of public in a couple of studies, and we have also published another example for a growth factor receptor for an FGF receptor, which is overexpressed and mutated. The mutations are rare, but they are there in uh, ER positive lobular tumors. I want to end with the downstream signaling of these growth factor receptors, so PI3 kinase and AKT signaling, and you can see here. As an example, again, from this very large TCGA study, that in lobular tumors, the downstream signaling, the activation of uh, AKT, 
shown here by phosphorylation of ATT is enriched in lobular tumors compared to ductile uh, tumors. Dr. Dirksen has done a couple of studies on those and has shown that in cell line models, uh, when you knock out Eketirin, AKT is phosphorylated, shown here and here, and these cells become more sensitive to AKT inhibitors. So to summarize, Eketirin is a hallmark of ILC. It causes decreased cell-cell attachment and subsequently different growth pattern. The estrogen receptor, Oh, I should actually say that these are always the abbreviation. This is the, ge the gene name for it, CDH1. And the gene name for the estrogen receptor is ESR1. Again, you might see this. It's a nuclear protein that binds estrogen and that's expressed in 95% of ILC. Lobular tumors are very hormone responsive and this can be tested in models in the lab along with uh, really response to clinical drugs, uh, anti-estrogen drugs. Cross factor receptor signaling, including a series of uh, including a large series of different ghost factor receptors is enriched in ILC. A ghost factor receptor downstream signaling, such as PI3 kinase and AKT, is also very active in ILC. And these features might provide therapeutic opportunities for patients with ILC. And I think there are a couple of studies ongoing. And again, looking forward to the next presentation. And I would uh, like to thank all of you for, for your attention. And I will uh, give it back to Siobhan. so much um Steffi thank you um and I have already um I have already um introduced Steffi we need you to just um switch off your screen sharing I think yeah okay thank you very much um again lots of questions coming in and it's great to see that we've got so many people online with us and again welcome to everybody who's joined us um I've already introduced Karen um out of turn, but Karen, you're more than welcome. So I don't think I need to say anything else. And uh, over to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Shioban, uh, also for the introduction uh, uh, from earlier. Uh, so yes, uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Um, and I would also like to thank the organizers to invite me here to speak. Um, in this presentation about lobular breast cancer from diagnosis to treatment, I will give an overview of some general concepts of the diagnosis and the treatment of lobular breast cancer. This is a very broad subject, and so not every topic can be addressed here in this presentation. I will first explain some main concepts of lobular breast cancer um, that were already explained a bit in the previous presentations. Uh, then we will go over the diagnosis and the staging, followed by treatment. We will see the different steps a patient with lobular breast cancer will follow during a treatment in both uh, a patient with and without metastasis. And metastasis are the presence of lobular breast cancer in other places in the body than the breast or the axilla. And finally, we will come to the con conclusion. Lobular breast cancer, often abbreviated as ILC, which stands for invasive lobular carcinoma, represents 10 to 15% of all breast cancers. In this example, it's even a bit more, as you can see. So here it's about 15%. Um, the distinction between lobular breast cancer and other subtypes is made under the microscope, where lobular breast cancer is usually seen as lines of cells, as you can see here in the scheme. And as we have heard uh, from Steffi, the majority is sensitive to female hormones, meaning that estrogen and progesterone will activate the cancer cells after binding to the hormone receptor, making the cells grow and divide. In the same way, another receptor called HER2 can be present on the cancer cell. Every cell has a few of these receptors present, but a cancer cell can have too many of them so that they can have they can get more signals to grow and divide. In lobular breast cancer, this phenomenon is not often seen, so only a minority or what we call HER2 positive. Then the grade of a tumor, um, that tells us something about how quickly cells divide and how much different they look from normal cells. There are three, three different grades, going from slow dividing cells with quite normal appearance, to quickly dividing cells with a totally different appearance. Most of the lobular breast cancers are in the middle and are grade two. But exceptions can always exist. 
So in lobular breast cancer, you have cells that are not sensitive to hormones. Um, you have also um, lobular breast cancers that do express HER2 uh, and are so uh, HER2 positive. And you have tumors that are grade one or grade three. But in general, majority is hormone. Grade two, minority is HER2 positive. They are distinguished by a different growth pattern and uh, 10 to 15% of all breast cancers are ILC. Now let's see how lobular breast cancer is diagnosed and staged. The aim of the diagnosis is to see whether there is a tumor present and if so, what type of tumor there is, how big it is, and if it has spread to the accelerated lymph nodes yet. To do so, we use something called triple assessment. This is the combination of a clinical examination of the breast and the axilla, different imaging techniques of also the breast and the axilla, and a biopsy to perform the microscopical examination. To look at the breast, mammography and ultrasound are most commonly used. Sometimes this can be combined with a 3D mammogram, also called a tomogram. Lobular breast cancer can be underestimated or sometimes even missed by mammogram. Therefore, in many occasions, also an MRI of the breast is performed for these patients at the timing of diagnosis. As said, the differentiation with other breast cancer subtypes is made under the microscope and different coloring techniques are used. Here in this, you see all lobular breast cancers. The purple dots are actually the cancer cells and the more pink color is some normal tissue that's in between. So here you see the classic lobular breast cancer. You see the lines of cells, of single cells, um, which compared to the solid form of lobular breast cancer, you see that the cells are more uh, dense um, present in, in the tissue. So lobular breast cancer is the same. About 15% is the classic form. The, 50, the other percent has, other, uh, has another growth pattern and is uh, different under the microscope. Besides the breast and the axilla, we also need to know what's going on in the rest of the body. We need to know if the cancer has spread to other parts of the body, if metastasis exists. Therefore, we need to do some staging examinations. Different types of imaging techniques can be used, and sometimes a combination of different techniques techniques is necessary. Ultrasound, for example, can be done to, uh, ex uh, to uh, examine the liver, radiography for the lungs, you have a bone scan, so often these three are uh, combined uh, to get a full idea of the body. But you can also use a CT scan, a PET CT scan, or an MRI scan. In these three, um, there's already um, an examination of the lungs, of the belly, and of the bones in one examination. In the example here, you see a PET CT and the uh, tumor lesions are lighting up on the PET CT. So here you have the lesion in the breast. You can also see it here. You have a metastasis to the sternal bone, as you can see here. And you have a metastasis in the liver, as you can see here. The black here is the bladder and above here is the brain. That's always normal on a PET CT to have that black color, so that's not a metastasis. With these staging examinations, so we do check for metastasis, the presence of lobular breast cancer outside the breast and the axilla. Lobular breast cancer spreads differently through the breast cancer subtypes. So besides the lungs, the liver, the bones, and the brain, uh, it can spread also to the stomach, the bowels, the ovary, ovaries and uterus, and even the eye socket. Now let's continue with the different aspects of treatment. The choice of a treatment plan depends on the characteristics of the tumor, the characteristics of the patient, and also the preferences of the patient to come to an individualized treatment for every patient. When we look at the tumor, the different receptors are important. So the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, HER2, but also the grade of the tumor, the size of the tumor, and whether or not that uh, cancer cells are present in the axillary lymph nodes are important. Of course, we're not only treating a tumor, we are treating a patient with a tumor. 
And here we need to look at the age of the patient. We need to look at the menopausal state, the general condition, other illnesses that might be present, other treatments that might have been given in the past, allergies that can be present, and side effects, and so on. So making a treatment plan, uh, plan is not an easy task, and it needs the collaboration of different types of specialists in the so-called multidisciplinary team. You need the radiologist to check the images. You need the pathologist to look under the microscope. You need an expert in radiotherapy. You need someone performing the surgery, and you need someone who knows more about the medical treatment. And they all decide together with the patient what is the best path to follow. And different types of treatment are given. You have the surgery and the radiotherapy, which are called local treatments. So these are treatments that uh, are performed to lower the risk that the cancer will come back at that particular place. On the other hand, you have the systemic treatments working in an entire body, lowering the risk for the entire body. And here you have the anti-hormonal uh, therapy, the chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and immunotherapy. And we will go over all these treatments one by one. First, starting with the local treatments. So when we look at the breast, we can either remove only the tumor, which is called a lumpectomy, or breast conserving uh, treatment, or we can remove the entire breast, breast, which is called a total mastectomy. For the axilla, we can either remove a few lymph nodes, which is called a sentinel lymph node biopsy. This is done when there is no suspicion on imaging that there are cancer cells present in the lymph nodes. And this is done to further investigate these lymph nodes microscopically. When we do know that there are cancer cells present in the lymph nodes, either through imaging or through biopsy, we will remove all the lymph nodes in a procedure called axillary clearance or axillary lymph node dissection. The other local treatment is radiotherapy. This is always performed when the breast is not entirely removed in order to be as safe as a mastectomy. But even when the breast is entirely removed, sometimes radiotherapy can still be necessary. This can be due to the location of the tumor or due to the presence of cancer cells in the lymph nodes or other factors. There are also different schemes that can be used, and so the duration can be different between hospitals and even between patients. It can start four to six weeks after surgery. However, if chemotherapy needs to be given too, some hospitals will give first the chemotherapy and then the radiotherapy. But giving it before chemotherapy is just as good. Let's now go over the different treatments of the entire body. First, the anti-hormonal treatment that was already introduced uh, by Steffi. Um, the anti-hormonal treatment is also called the endocrine treatment. And the two best known treatments are aromatase inhibitors and tamoxifen, both making sure that less estrogen can bind to the estrogen receptor of the cancer cell, either by less production of estrogen or by binding to the receptor themselves. Aromatase inhibitors can, also, can only be used in women who don't have any ovarian function anymore, like postmenopausal women. Tamoxifen can be used both in pre- and postmenopausal women. In general, there is a preference for the use of aromatase inhibitors for patients with lobular breast cancer, since it was shown that this lowers the risk of recurrence more than does tamoxifen. However, on an individual basis, there might be a preference for the use of tamoxifen because of menopausal state, side effects, other illnesses, and so on. Chemotherapy are drugs that attack all quickly dividing cells in the body. It cannot differentiate between cancer cells and other normally, normal quickly dividing cells, like blood cells. And so it will co kill both the cancer cells and red blood cells. It is said that chemotherapy works less for lobular breast cancer. Now, in general, tumors that are hormone sensitive divide less quickly than tumors that are not hormone sensitive. The less quickly a tumor divides, the less reactive it is to chemotherapy. 
Since the majority of lobular breast cancer is hormone sensitive, this explains why chemotherapy seems to work less in these patients. But working less does not mean that it does not work. So some patients with lobular breast cancer do benefit from chemotherapy. And it always needs to be decided on an individual level if the patient needs it or not. Anti-HER2 treatment is an example of targeted therapy. So the cancer cell can have too many HER2 receptors and they can be targeted with specific drugs that bind to these receptors. The receptor can then not function anymore and it stops sending out signals to further grow and divide. Lastly, we have immunotherapy, which uses the body's own immune system. So cancer cells can trick immune cells into thinking that they are normal cells. So they bind with the immune cells and they actually switch them off. The immune cells will not attack the cancer cells. Immunotherapy will break the bond between the immune cell and the cancer cell. The immune cell now sees that the cancer cell is indeed an enemy and they will. We will now go over the flow a patient with invasive lobular breast cancer has to follow in case no metastases are detected upon diagnosis. So first you have the diagnosis and the staging, then uh, neoadjuvant therapy, uh, then surgery, adjuvant treatment, and after uh, the treatment, the patient will be further followed. It is important to note that not every patient needs to go through all the different treatment steps. So neoadjuvant treatment, for example, is not often needed. Neoadjuvant treatments are the treatments given before surgery with the aim to shrink the tumor. It's also called preoperative treatment. It is used to change the type of the surgery from removal of the entire breast to just removal of the tumor. However, it can also be used to learn more about the tumor and how it responds to therapy. It can consist of chemotherapy, anti-hormonal treatment, anti-HER2 treatment, or it can be a drug that is a part of a clinical trial. And three outcomes are possible. The tumor can either remain the same size, it can shrink, or it can disappear on imaging. Either way, we will always aim to perform surgery afterwards. We know that when the tumor has not responded well, that we need to give additional treatments after surgery. In the case a tumor does disappear, we are not sure that it's also the case under the microscope. So to be sure, surgery also has to follow in this case. Adjuvant treatment are the treatments that are given after surgery. And here the aim is to lower the risk of ever coming back, either locally in the breast or in the entire body. So at the breast, the local radiotherapy can be used. For the entire body, we use chemotherapy, anti-hormonal treatment, anti-R2 treatment, or again, drugs that are um, used in clinical trials or a combination of these treatments. After completion of surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, anti r treatment, the patient will go into follow-up. Anti-hormonal treatment can be continued up until five to 10 years during this follow-up. With follow-up, we mean the checkups that are done on a regular basis containing clinical e examination, imaging of the breast and blood tests. The frequency and the duration is again something that differs individually. During the checkup, we need to see if the anti-hormonal treatment is tolerated well. Side effects may include hot flashes that can lead to sleep deprivation, abnormal vi vaginal bleeding, vaginal dryness and sexual dysfunction, muscle and joint pain, weight gain, and back pain. If a treatment becomes unbearable, we can either start supportive treatment, we can switch to a different type of treatment, or sometimes even stop the anti-hormonal treatment. Other symptoms that are important to report are changes to the breast, unexplained weight loss, um, unexplained bone pain, changes in the eyesight, swelling in the neck or axilla, un unexplained shortness of breath, long lasting belly pain, and frequent headaches, dizziness, or problems with balance. 
If these symptoms are reported, the or reported the physician will perform a more extensive clinical examination and if needed additional examinations like additional blood tests or imaging techniques can be done let's now look to a patient with metastasis again the diagnosis is made all the different systemic treatment types um, or a combination hereof can be given and sometimes local treatments are used um, as well to get symptom control locally, for example, to relieve pain. But the systemic treatments treating the entire body are the most important in the case of metastasis. Imaging is done on a regular basis, often every three months, with a scan that looks at the entire body. So the CT scan, bone scan can be used in some uh, occasions uh, too. You have the PET CT and you have an MRI of the whole body that can be used. Um, with the exception of chemotherapy and local treatments, the treatments are continued as long as they work or as long as uh, the side effects are well tolerated. So to conclude, for diagnosis and staging, we need the combination of clinical examination, different imaging techniques and the microscopical examination. Not every patient is the same, not every tumor is the same, and this leads to individual treatment plans. Patients that have not that uh, not have any metastasis will often get a combination of local and systemic treatments. Where for patients with metastasis, the treatments for the entire body uh, are the most important. So the systemic treatments are the most important. Local treatments uh, are in this case only used for symptom control, uh, like the relief of pain, for example. You can find more information about lobular breast cancer on the website of the LBCA and the ELBCC. However, the website for ELBCC is uh, currently under construction uh, as we speak, but uh, um, will soon contain a lot of additional information. With the ELBCC, we have also developed a leaflet, uh, especially for newly diagnosed patients, that will be translated into different languages and will be spread out all over Europe. This is the other side of the leaflet. And then I would like to thank you for your attention and I am happy to take any questions. Oh, Karen, thank you so much. Um, as I said earlier, we do have a number of questions and I'm going to go through some of them now with you. Um, um, I just would like to say a huge thank you to uh, the patient advocates who worked on that leaflet with Karen and, and Thais and uh, Patrick and Christine. It's been an absolute pleasure and we're really looking forward to having that available across Europe. Um, meanwhile, we, we've got the LBCA who, who have been our mentors right from the get-go. So, you know, it's been fantastic. So again, um, I'm going to kick off with a question here. Um, on the first presentation, I was interested to see the slide showing the driver landscape of breast cancer. I was surprised to see that the main ones were the PIK3, CA, uh, TP353 ones, more so than the BRCA1 and 2. Are these tested for routinely the way the BRCA ones are, and if not, should they be? Now, is that something that needs to go back to somebody's team, or does anybody here want to comment on that? Um, or, or, or is that something for, a, 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 you know, a, a perhaps more complex discussion? I think I can um, answer uh, this question. So actually the, the landscape of driver genes that, um, that I was showing in that uh, slide actually represents uh, mutations that are only present in the tumor cells, so only in the, in the cancer cells. And these are mutations that are normally not present in the other cells of the body. So these are really cancer-specific mutations. When, um, when we refer to other genes, like you have heard of the ones like BRCA1, BRCA2, uh, these are actually what we call germline mutations. So these are uh, mutations, when you have them, you will have them in all the bodies of your cells, and this will actually increase the risk of developing breast cancer during your life. So this is very different. So these mutations are tested for because you, they know, uh, you know then if you have these mutations that this will increase the risk of ever developing breast cancer. 
but the other ones are actually what we call the somatic mutations, those that are only present in the cancer cells, to make it easy. Thanks very much, Christine, for that. Um, and another question here, um, which came in a little while ago, for some, oh, sorry, for small stage one grade one ILCs, are studies currently evaluating extending AIs past five years specifically for this cancer subtype? Um, as far as I know, I don't think uh, any studies are currently done um, that are specifically looking at lobular breast cancer now. Oh, yeah, I think there are a few studies have been done, but not specifically for patients with lobular breast cancer. And then that's always a little bit of a challenge to retrospectively to look into the study and basically pull out the information for the patients with lobular breast cancer, right? Because then you only, only have 10% of the entire study population being patients with ILC. So sometimes it's quite difficult because then the number's relatively small. Then the question is, can you really get, uh, you know, solid data from that? Even if you can pull it up, even if retrospectively you can look which tumor was a lobular outductal, but then maybe the number isn't large enough to really make solid, you know, statistical conclusion. So, and I think that's something what the advocates really have taken on. And again, I think that will be discussed more over the next few days to say, we really need trials specifically for ILC. And if it's not only exclusively for ILC, at least, you know, enrich for patients with ILC, that the number is large enough to make that conclusion. I mean, the extended hormone therapy is a really good example because if these tumors are really so, you know, ER rich, and if there's, you know, rising, increasing evidence for late recurrences, which happens in ER positive disease, the question of, you know, extended hormonal therapy is a really important one. So I think we will see more on that, but only looking at you know, existing trials where you might or you might not have 10% is not the answer. That's not sufficient. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, another question here. What is the value of multi-gene prognostic panel tests for ILC? Good question. So maybe I will uh, uh, actually, in, in my presentation of tomorrow, I will do a full review of all these multi-gene prognostic assays. So I think uh, it's too complicated to answer now in two minutes, because um, basically it's complicated to compare apples with pears and grapefruit. So um, also so far, I think we need to be very um, critical still with the available data, um, but tomorrow I will present an overview of that. Thanks, thanks, Christine. Um, yeah, some of the questions are, are, you know, you can see that there's a huge level of interest and and and, and wide, wide topics here. Um, so when you don't have, we hear a lot about dense breasts and the need for um, perhaps MRI or further screening, whatever. It's something that I'm really passionate about and I advocate for it. But the question here is when you don't have dense breasts, is it still advisable to look for an MRI for the follow-up? You know, um, I suppose that's at it, the early uh, diagnosis. Well, I think we need to distinguish between the timing of the diagnosis and the follow-up indeed. Uh, so at the time of diagnosis, it depends a bit on uh, which hospital you're at, if an M MRI is done or not. Uh, here in, in Leuven, we do have um, the protocol to do always an MRI if it is a lobular breast cancer. Um, but it depends also a bit on, on the situation, if it's really necessary or not. So if it's already clear that you will do uh, the removal of the entire breast, so a mastectomy from the mammogram, the extra information you get from the MRI is very little. But if there's any doubt, I would always advise to do an extra MRI. Um, indeed, if you want to do um, uh, just a lumpectomy, so just the removal of the tumor, 
you need to be 100% sure because otherwise it might be that the patient will be getting surgery two times. So in order to avoid that, I think it's better when there's any doubt to do an MRI, even in breasts that are not as dense. But you know, yeah, it's uh, it's true that the sensitivity of a mammogram is better in patients who don't have dense breasts. Thanks, thanks, Karen. We're hearing an awful lot more about that um, throughout Europe. And certainly, I think we will continue to, as advocates anyway, be talking about that a lot more. Um, Siobhan, can I just quickly make yes. one more comment? Is that tomorrow there will be a presentation from Dr. Hannah Linden on uh, you know, other imaging choices and uh, research that's ongoing. So I think for whoever's interested in to really come to Dr. Linden's presentation tomorrow, because as many of you know, there are clearly challenges with the imaging uh, for these lobular cells in part because they just grow so different. So we really need more research in that area. And uh, yeah, Dr. Linden will present on that tomorrow. So that might be a good session to attend. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, but also, please, please remember to just go through the, um, you know, the agenda for the next couple of days because, you know, we will all have different levels of interest about different things. So there's there's a, a, a lot of information to come over the next day or two. So thanks, Steffi, for that reminder. Um, can you explain signet ring features a little bit more? So I think that came in just after. <laughs> you know, I please, please, uh, you know, if you if you think that this is something that needs to be explored a little bit more, we can come back to it. But these are the questions, and and some of the questions are spot on. I think. Yeah. So signet ring is uh, another uh, visualization of lobular breast cancer under the microscope. And um, it actually resembles a signet ring. So um, the nucleus is very much on the side of uh, the cell and there are large, uh, yeah, uh, what we call vacuoles. So uh, it yeah, really appears to be like a, a ring um, with the yeah, nucleus being a bit larger uh, and therefore therefore the name was uh, was made um, all these different types of uh, presentation also come with different types of characteristics of the tumor um, but I must say I don't know uh, now by heart for signet ring with uh, characteristics are uh, mostly present in, in this I don't know if uh, Christine or uh, Stephanie yes, know more about I this. I think here I mainly also want to refer to uh, the presentation of tomorrow, also in the diagnosis and imaging session uh, by uh, Matthias Christian, who is a pathologist and will uh, go much more in depth about all the different histological subtypes within lobular breast cancer and what the relevance is. So. Okay. Um, so we may, um, we may therefore skip through some of these questions because there are a number of them. Um, does anybody want to take on a question in relation to the kind of tumor markers that are being looked at in liquid biopsies? There are a number of questions here about liquid biopsies and whether or not they're currently, um, you know, part of, of practice, um, uh, widespread practice. If you want to. Yeah, I can comment on this. And, you know, there might be differences between different, you know, countries or even between the US and Europe as a whole. So I think here it is now uh, very common to test or to look for specific mutations in liquid biopsies. Unfortunately, uh, you know, that can't be done too often. I don't know exact how, how much, how often the insurance pay for that test. If it's only once, or if it's, I know it's not at every time of progression. So, uh, but it is sent out for looking at specific mutation, the mutation Christine mentioned earlier on. That is very important now that we have, you know, a large number of drugs available for a specific potential driver mutations. Christine mentioned and Karen mentioned some of those. Uh, trials and uh, approaches. A really good example are HER2 mutations, right? Or even PIC kinase mutations or others. So there are now drugs there and you want to know whether that mutation is a new tumor or not. And 
you know, that might not have been in the primary tumor, but it might be in the metastatic lesion. So testing for that is very important. And, you know, like, uh, you know, Karen explained really nicely, I think in liquid biopsies, we can identify these mutations. There are research, I saw one of the other questions was like the concordance between the solid metastasis and the liquid biopsy. It's a really great question. We, we ask that question all the time. And, you know, I think it's at the moment, it's still a research question and we need more, you know, we need more studies, uh, access, it's not, you can't always do uh, biopsies of uh, solid metastasis. So it's not, not easy to really get get large number, but we, in general, we think there's reasonable concordance. And yeah, so I think these tests are there are multiple companies. I don't want to mention one or the other, there are multiple companies which are used, which do these tests. And uh, it is very, very critical to test for those in the presence of available drugs. Yes, maybe I also just want to add uh, that in addition to that, what is still really growing uh, because of the technological advances is also the advantage to use the information that is present in these liquid biopsies to clearly monitor the uh, progression of the disease because the sensitivity is getting much better. And so you can identify some patient specific mutations that you would like to track along the time uh, in repeated blood sampling. And this could potentially help to identify earlier some disease recurrence. However, this is still at the stage of research, but is moving on really very well. Thank you both. Um, th there's a number of questions in relation to blood tests. Uh, again, you know, um, perhaps you'll give some guidance as to whether this ought to go back to somebody's um, own team or oncologist, but which blood tests are required by follow-up for somebody who doesn't have metastasis? Do we have well, this I think this differs uh, a lot uh, between countries as well. What we do here is we check for the uh, liver function. We check the calcium rate for the bones. And um, in Belgium, uh, we also check the tumor marker, but I know that this is not done in many other uh, countries. Um, and the um, rationale about this is that we are yeah, gonna treat patients sometimes in a bit too early phase. So when the disease is not symptomatic yet. So when we see that the tumor uh, marker is uh, risen, we will do imaging. We will sometimes detect metastasis and we will already start treating them. Also uh, already start treating the patient. So uh, in other countries, the tumor marker is not uh, taken. So they don't know. And they only start treating the patients when the metastatic. But actually, studies have shown that either way, it's as good. So even treating the patient more early will not uh, give different results in overall survival. So, but I, I understand the patients want to know. And so here in Belgium, they're quite happy that we do it. And uh, it will not be easy to say we're going to stop doing it because patients won't uh, take it, I think. Um, but yeah, it doesn't really give a benefit to do the tumor marker, but yeah, we continue on doing it. Yeah, thanks, thanks Karen. Uh, I hear similar um, from my oncologist here as well, you know, so the, it, it, I suppose it's it's just different opinions, as, as you say. Um, so another one here, are there any studies on history of fertility treatments? Um, IBF in particular, I suppose, um, is being mentioned here, causing or you know, attributing to ILC. Uh, so as far as I know, not many studies have been done in general about um, yeah, IVF or other uh, fertility treatments and breast cancer. And so for ILC, it's even yeah, the more difficult to uh, examine this. So um yeah we don't really know the relation uh, between them okay thank you um you know there's a huge huge lot to discover as we move forward and to see you know lobular 
um, specific trials coming on board is, is really exciting. And I suppose a lot of these things will come as a result of that. Um, just scanning through here again, it, it, you know, we've got a lot of questions about tamoxifen versus AIs or whether or not, um, you know, there's been any um, current recommendation of five years for AIs or 10 years, you know, and, and again, that's a discussion that comes up amongst patients very often. also something yeah, very interesting and sometimes also very individual so in some patients we will stop indeed at after five uh, years sometimes it is uh, indeed continued um, until seven years seven years and a half or uh, even ten years but that really depends on all the characteristics of the patient and of the the tumor were the lymph nodes involved? Was it grade two? Was it grade three? That all depends on what is the risk that it will recur, and do we see an additional benefit um, of the treatment, and also on how the treatment is to uh, tolerated by the patient. If the patient is getting a lot of side effects, if the the um, joint pain is, is too much, yeah. It's it's uh, really a balance between um, the benefit of the the treatment. And the side effects, and it's yeah very individual choice. Uh, yeah, we have to make w together with the patient. Yeah, yeah, like a lot of a lot of things. Um, um, perhaps we're we're coming to the point where we we might um, use any additional time for um, if we have enough time to go back to all three of you. One last question um, about how significant is the present. Uh, presence of LCIS in ILC patients and should it be dealt with surgically? Karen, I think we'll go to you with that one. But um, yeah. um, so um, it depends also again on what type of LCIS is present. Uh, so you have different uh, types again under the microscope. Um, and for some, uh, it has been said that there is not a, uh, a clear um, prognostic effect of it. So that it's not clear that it will develop into cancer. So it can be followed up uh, with imaging. Um, but if it's also a, a great tree, if it's, it's um, more of a risk that it will develop into cancer, then I would advise uh, to surgically remove it indeed. Okay, and I'm being reminded here, sorry, I'm being reminded here that there's been a few questions um, about onco type and mammoprint. Uh, so I'm just going, I, I know I said we'd we'd revert back to, but it, perhaps that's something that you, if we, if we go back to all three of you, I think, and is that okay with everybody? Um, a lot of, there are other questions, but I'm, I'm sure they're going to be dealt with in, in the scientific discussions over the next couple of days. So I think we leave it with that and um, perhaps just take that one last question. Yeah, yeah, I think that question is, is coming back to the more general question about the multi-gene prognostic tests, actually. So I think it's better to take the time to answer uh, that uh, calmly tomorrow mm -hmm. so that we can explain, you know, the differences between the tests, the difference between the results, the patient cohorts where it was evaluated. So um, I think it's better to take the time tomorrow. I think evidence starts accumulating, but we still need more. Thanks, Chris. So back to you, I think, Steffi, at this point. Yeah, no, just quickly, I saw a few questions on uh, tamoxifen, uh, other under-estrogen, full western. And the only thing I just want to mention, because there was one specific question saying about tamoxifen, you know, causing tumors to grow. And I'll just say that uh, that question might have come up from that cell line experiment I showed where tamoxifen is functioning as what we call an agonist. So I just wanna explain this a bit more that basically full Westrand, which degrades the estrogen receptor is what we call a pure antagonist. So it's really, it, you know, really only inhibits the estrogen receptor and uh, doesn't uh, activate it. However, tamoxifen and some, depending on the tissue, 
it either activates the estrogen receptor or inhibits it. That's why we call it, it has a mixed activity. Sometimes it's an antagonist and sometimes it's an agonist. And, you know, agonist activities of these terms are very well known in bone, for example, where we really appreciate these agonist activities. But in some cases, and these cases are rare, tamoxifen can also be an agonist for the breast, for breast cancer cells. And the slide I showed for that one cell in MM134, so we as researchers, we think, okay, this is a great model. This is a great model for the rare cases where tamoxifen actually functions as an agonist. But from clinical trials, we don't have, uh, we know that tamoxifen does not function as an agonist for the majority of ILC tumors. That's not the case. For the majority of tumors, it works really, really well. And in a few cases, it doesn't. And unfortunately, we can't really tell you for which cases it uh, functions as an agonist versus as an agonist. We don't know. The research is ongoing. You will hear some studies, some uh, present, you will see some presentations tomorrow or the day after where on discussion, on trials, and actually one trial is, uh, is ongoing here, but there are others ongoing as well, where we really try to differentiate, to figure out which hormonal therapy is better for lobular than the others, given we have choices. Uh, there's one study published uh, from the uh, BIC-198, and Dr. Metzger might mention this, where it shows that the relative, relative efficacy of aromatase inhibitors is better in ductal than in lobular cancer. However, however, that's only one study. And for us to really make solid conclusions on you know, changing treatment recommendations, I think we need more uh, studies. And I can tell you there is a very, very large study ongoing uh, analyzing really all major endocrine trials and pulling out data either for ductal and lobular cancer, and that data should come out very soon to really see, okay, what is it? Is that, is that difference uh, really true? Does that really uh, confirm in a, large, in a large clinical trial setting? So at the moment, um, we really, we don't know that. But I don't want to mislead you and that you think, wow, you know, tamoxifen makes each lobular tumor grow. That's not the case. That's absolutely not the case. We are happy, again, to have different models for different clinical case scenarios, and we'll study this in the lab. But, uh, I, hope, I hope that, you know, answered the question. Yeah, I, I, I think to alleviate, you know, any, any kind of anxiety is hugely important. And obviously, as patients, we tend to, I know I do, we pick up on these negative aspects sometimes. Um, so thanks, Steffi. I think it's really important to, to stress, you know, the, 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 the facts in relation to it. Um, the question here as to whether or not, um, you know, the, the questions that we do not get around to, I think um, certainly as, as, as moderator, I'd like to say that we will uh, try to answer anything that remains unanswered at the end of this. There will always be, as we've had such a huge um, a response, very positive response. Um, a lot of people uh, thanking the presenters at the moment for the level of information that's come through and how clear and, and the fact that it's been in lay terms, which has been really, really important. Um, that's something that I know all of you worked really, really hard on. And uh, it's definitely, definitely had a, a really good response here. So I think what I would say um, is that as a, a group of patient advocates, we will endeavour to find answers to any questions that just haven't been, you know, fully uh, gotten around to today. And anything that's left over from um, today, I'm sure will be covered over the next two days. And to remind uh, patient advocates and patients that we have another patient session on the 30th so there will be various topics there of interest. So we'll take a, a look back at what's been happening here. And uh, I'm not going to take any more of uh, the time from Christine, Steffi and Karen. So back to you. And um, if there's anything you'd like to add. Thanks, Sharon, for doing a great job moderating it. Thank you. And thanks, yeah, everybody for helping us to put this together. Mm -hmm. 
you're on you're on yeah yeah i also wanted to thank uh, everyone for the organization this was a, i think a beautiful session already to organize together between patients patients advocates and and us um and trying uh to yeah to get some concepts uh explained more clearly to take the time and we hope that this will be also an advantage to follow the remaining uh, symposium actually in the following days. So thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, can I just say, um, just as moderator, there's been a, a backstage crew here involved. Um, we've had um, patient advocates from uh, the Netherlands and Norway and uh, Claire from Lovelier UK. So they've all been here in the background helping me. Um, and this is my first uh, time to moderate. So it's been an absolute pleasure. And Karen, I think I think you should have the last word. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> I want to say uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, speak for you. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, and it's always a pleasure to interact with, uh, with patient advocates. I learn a lot from from them as well, um, and I would like to keep on uh, doing so. Uh, so thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for your attention, and uh, yeah, <laughs> have a nice uh, have a nice day for the room. Yeah, no, again, thanks, and you know, there are so many people we have to thank, and you know, we also, as I'm sure, well, most of you appreciate that sometimes with these virtual uh, meetings, like the day before, you suddenly like have some freak outs that you don't know how to share. So I also want to thank you know Nadine, who is on the call, who helped us a lot to connect with Axel events and stuff. So anyway, thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you, and and good luck to everybody over the next couple of days because I know um, you're going to have a, a, a fairly hectic time and we're all looking forward to tuning in and we encourage everybody to share it on social media platforms and uh, you know just get it out there to anybody who may need to know that doesn't already know okay guys thanks million well done to everybody thank bye -bye. you thank you bye -bye. see you tomorrow bye-bye